o'clock. I'm going to call the meeting to order. And before we get to approval of minutes, I just want to thank everybody for coming to the meeting tonight. And I hope everyone received the revised um, update on the agenda. And I think just want to make sure we're all on the same page tonight so we can get through this and make sure we answer everybody's questions and all leave feeling secure and confident with what we're doing. So with Amen. that, uh, we should do a roll call of the board members just for just for the record. Right. Let me forget so, we're not person. Jen Insaldi. Here. Jerry Doherty. Here. Keith Bradley. Nope. Okay. Kate Fournier. Here. And Micah. Here. Great. Great. Uh, motion to approve minutes from 720. Second. Any questions or updates? No, I see none. All those in favor of approving the minutes from 720? Jen Nansaldi. Yes. Jerry Doherty. Yes. Kate Fournier? Yes. And Micah Burhardt? Yes. So as for citizen comments, at this time I would like to preface this section if you have any comments in reference to the reopening or uh, and the plans that we haven't seen yet, if you could hold those until after we go over the plan, that would be most helpful. I think a lot of questions will be answered once Gail's presentation and we have a discussion about that with the school board. So if you have any other citizen comments at this time, um, feel free to let, them, let me know. No? Okay. I'm not seeing any of you, Kevin. No. no. Okay, great. Uh, presentation of school programs. Nothing new from me tonight. I don't think Gail has anything at this point. Okay, we don't have any. Uh, Gail, anything from you, hon? No. Take that as a no. Okay. All business tuition contract. Do we have anything updated on that, Kevin, at this time? No, I think people are trying to get through this reentry process, and I think that in the in the fall, September, we'll be looking at organizing and getting a uh, introductory meeting together. Great. Instructional issues? I don't think we have any this evening. Nope. Okay, we have some personnel actions. 7A, election of Casey Gilmore as enrichment after school coordinator. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Any discussion needed? Just her name is Cassie. Oh. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Welcome. All right. My roll call, Jen Insaldi? Yes. Jerry Doherty? Yes. Kate Fournier? Yes. And Micah? Yes. Great. 7B, election of Douglas Clement as bus driver. Motion. That's so moved. Jerry, second. Second. All right. Any discussion on Douglas? Um, I don't have any on, on on Douglas. Just in general, what's the the field like for for finding bus drivers? Is it still really really hard? I imagine it's even harder now. But it, it is, and I think Jerry, some of the uncertainty of what school's going to look like weighs into that as well. But um, yeah, we're fortunate to have Doug who has worked in, in the district in other capacities and uh, most recently passed his, his bus driver license. So we're, we're glad to have him. We do have a few um, substitute bus drivers that are out there, but um, yeah, it's, it's not a, yeah, a plethora of bus drivers, let's put it that way. Yeah. So can, can Douglas also fill in as a substitute teacher? I think that was on his, <laughs> he has and he can. They do it all. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Jen Insaldi? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Kate? Yes. Dan Micah? Yes. Okay. And we're accepting 7C, accept resignation of John Ball. I did get a, uh, a letter of resignation. Um, and he thanks you folks. Uh, but he has received a full-time job as a 
lead custodian in another another building. Oh, good for him. Okay. Okay. All those accepting with. Uh, with the... I make a motion to accept with regret the resignation of John Vaughn. That's what I was looking for. Thank you. I second that. All right, Jen. Yes. Jerry. Yes. Key. Yes. And Micah. Yes. We do have 7D that um, just came forward. I'll put that up in case you can't see it. Um, but Pam and, and Gail uh, have seen an increase in the needs. And Jenny Meyer serves as a special ed teacher. So there's a recommendation to increase her time by one hour per day. Motion. Make a motion to approve. I make a motion to increase Jenny Myers' hours by one hour per day. I can second that. Yep. Thanks. Any discussion? For a second, I thought it was a resignation. I got really sad. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm not going to let her go. No. <laughs> that we wouldn't accept. Yeah. yeah. No. All right. All those in favor? Jen? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Kate? Yes. And Micah. Yes. All right. Anything else under this? No? Yeah, that's it. Good. Okay. Business Affairs Budget Status Report. Anything? Anybody? Questions? No? Okay. Kevin, Superintendent? Yeah, really, um, you know, the focus is on still continuing to to shape everything out, putting all the pieces in place, hiring staff, um, and and really, it, it's just a matter of getting ready for for go time here. Whatever whatever decisions are made, and um, continuing to just just do what we we do this time of year, getting ready for new teacher orientation, which will start a week from today. Um, so we'll we'll get those folks on board. Excited about the quality of the candidates we are getting across the board. So, but other than that, that's, that's really my report at this time. It's good to hear though, that we're getting some. Yeah. All right, Gail. All right. If Kevin will throw up the um, report here. I, after last meeting, um, you as a board charged me with taking a look at the SAU 9 model um, and tweaking it in such a way to make it more uh, receptive and welcoming towards all learners in our building, maintaining our community and also working with staff to determine how we could best do that. So um, the staff re-entry committee and I have been working and, and here's a draft of what we've come up with. Next slide. So here, this is the information or the data on the numbers of families that responded. Um, Susan did call all of those families who did not respond to the SAU-9 survey. Um, they were asked to indicate whether they would prefer to be remote, come back face to face. Um, we had to add an I'm not sure yet or I don't know yet column as some parents were reluctant to commit until they knew more about what, what it was going to look like. And then we had a couple who have not responded to several inquiries. You'll notice on the right that down at the bottom, we have had three first grade students and one third grade student inquire about enrolling in our school. They have not yet registered, so they are not included in the totals you see in that grid. But as you can see at the bottom, uh, we had nine students to um, be in the remote classroom, had 27 students definitely wanted face-to-face seven were not sure and two were still waiting on. So that would be a total of 45 students. Staff children are included in, in the total on the right. Next slide. So the team, as I mentioned before, was made up of Helen Crowell, the school nurse. She was also on the SAU-9 committee. Myself, I was also on the SAU-9 committee. John Marshall represented the Upper House. Sonia Porter represented the Unified Arts Team. 
Margot Robert re represented the lower house. Susan was there as the school secretary and John Stokey uh, was involved as the custodian um, around the facilities issues. Next slide. So we, when looking at the SAU 9 plan, none of us had any issues with the guidance that we used to come up with the decisions there. So we may just made a statement of we support the guidance and understandings that the SAU plan referred to. We accepted the research, the work with Helen, the school nurses, and all of the tremendous amount of effort that went into um, making up that plan. I don't think any of us questioned the science and the, um, you know, recommendations of the doctors and so forth. So we've accepted that at face value. And we wanted to expand a little bit upon what we already have in place within the facility um, that we maybe haven't had a chance to talk about. So um, we plan on keeping access to the, the building limited to staff and students only. Um, John has thoroughly researched sanitizing practices and put those into place and prepared with materials and supplies to follow those practices. Um, we have developed cohorts with students and we expect students and staff members to stay together in their cohorts throughout the day and we'll have assigned spaces, including restrooms, that they'll um, use for educational purposes sanitizing any space that any group would use over and over that would be shared but most spaces will not be shared other than the pavilion outside we have bought or not bought it yet but we've ordered a tent it's coming soon i hope and we have the gazebo and some other outdoor spaces that we'll utilize for as much as we can and while making sure that students are seated six feet apart and we'll be also requiring masks do you want to go to the next slide, Kevin? So, so John has spent a little bit of time um, making sure that all the filters are clean in our fresh air circulation system. I know there's been some discussion statewide about that. We have a fresh air intake and a stale air exhaust, but it doesn't retreat our interior air. So that was important in that we are continually refreshing the air for when the students are in the building. Um, masks would be required for everyone when we aren't required, when we aren't able to socially dis distance. There'll be some breaks for snack and lunch, of course. And when students are seated in the outside environment, six feet apart, um, it won't be as necessary for them to have their masks so they, we can enact some mask breaks, understanding that the kids, you know, some of the younger kids in particular might struggle a little bit with that. We are going to provide two masks per student, thanks to Ragged Mountain. And we have a su good supply of um, disposable ones available as well. Students are also welcome to have homemade ones. And uh, from the guidance and the research, they must be two layers of cotton to be most effective according to the CDC. There had been questions about face masks um, or face shields rather, and those have not been proven to be as effective as the face masks. So in some circumstances, if a student might require one due to a health need or a 504 plan, that can be addressed on an individual basis with students. But for the most part, we are stating that all staff and students in the building will be wearing masks when they're not outside, able to be socially distanced. I think the clear window mask too, we have ordered some of the clear window masks that will enable students to be able to see your lips for um, articulation and for teaching reading and, and that kind of thing. Next slide. So we are going to encourage frequent hand washing at a minimum before and after recess, lunch, and coming to school and before leaving school. The uh, keyboards, desks, door handles, restrooms, all the frequently touched surfaces that we talk about will be cleaned and sanitized. Teachers and aides will help John with that and the custodians with that. We will not have students sharing materials. Gone is the day of the big crayon bin in the middle of the table. Each student will have their own crayons, rulers, etc. 
Um, the classrooms, we've removed rugs, stuffed furniture, books and things that cannot be easily sanitized. And hand sanitizing stations have been installed as have touch-free um, faucets and water fountains, et cetera, so that um, we can keep the, the hands cleaner, even those surfaces, as Helen just talked to us of today about, are not as big a transmitter of virus and, and bacteria as they had previously thought. Next slide. So um, I don't know if Helen, I'm gonna ask, ask Helen to maybe check in. The Nurses Association has just um, released a best practices document and I have a link to it in this um, presentation. But Helen, if you would talk a, a, just a little bit about um, some of the health recommendations from that. Your, your mic off. All right, um, so the, I think the main um, uh, points that are that haven't already been covered as far as masking and all that goes are the screening procedures and the um, the responses to um, kids kids or staff with um, symptoms or po a positive test or suspected test or uh, uh, contact, and that's all outlined um, in the. Um, in this guidance, um, it's been gone over really thoroughly and vetted by the Department of um, Public Health. Uh, Dr. Chan and Dr. Talbot went over it really with a fine tooth comb. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty well vetted. It's a really good document. Um, I guess the major points are we need to figure out um, screening, um, how we're going to do um, screening. Every, everyone needs to be screened every day. Or ideally, kids would be screened at home but we do need to have some kind of procedures also in place for screening at school. And then there's also a procedure in place for kids who um, come to school, seem fine, and then um, have some kind of a symptom. And the symptoms are really vague. So some, so kids are gonna be being sent home for you know, runny noses, sore throats, uh, coughs, things that we you know, just in general see constantly in a school, particularly in the fall. So I think, um, there is definitely the, um, it's definitely going to be onerous to parents in the beginning. Um, kids who are sent home with symptoms, if they get a test and the test is negative, they can come right back to school as soon as they're, you know, like if it was a fever, if it's 24 hours, if they have a negative test, they can come back to school. If they don't get tested or if their test is positive, they have to follow the, uh, 10 and one rule for, um, isolation. Um, so if, if, a par if parents decide they don't want to test a child, we would have to assume that they are positive and they would be out for at least 10 days. Um, and then there's the quarantine, which would be someone who's a contact needs to be um, out for 14 days. In school, we need to have, uh, on the bus and in school, we need to have really good attendance and seating charts because the contact tracers from the state are going to be using the, um, the within six feet for more than 10 minutes rule in order if there was a positive a kid with a positive test we don't necessarily have to shut down the whole school or even a whole classroom we can if we can point to our um, seating plans and and the teachers know where everybody was we can say okay these people were in that within six feet for more than 10 minutes bubble, nobody else was, we don't need to shut down the classroom. Does that make sense? Yep, and I think um, Kevin just shared the link with everyone, Helen, so um, why don't you folks at home read that over and if we don't address some of those concerns, you can contact us on, um, you know, a, a, at a later time. But we have, what we're planning on doing at this point until we get an app, we'll be sending you an email every day at 6 a.m. with a checklist for you to indicate that your child has been screened and the same with the staff. So thank you, Helen. Can, next slide, Kevin. So a cohort, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit. Some people had a lot of questions about what the typical day 
was going to look like and I talked about a cohort of students. So a cohort is anywhere between nine and 12 students in our building and each cohort will have two staff members assigned to it for the day. We no longer will have aides like jumping in and out, excuse me, to cover certain things or to go to recess with kiddos. The teacher and the secondary adult, whether it's another teacher, a specialist, or a paraprofessional, will stay together and be responsible for those students throughout the day. They'll attend lunch and recess together and all sh share a bathroom other than the staff. The staff has their own assigned bathroom and the children have one in their room for their cohorts use only. That gets at what Helen was talking about, about being able to identify everyone who's been exposed within the building. Um, so that's one of our kind of rules or guidelines is that they will always stay together in their cohort. Um, and again, we'll be using our um, outdoor spaces, weather permitting as much as we can until it gets too cold. Next slide. So a, a sample day for us will be that at home, all staff and parents of children will go through the screening process and submit that to Miss Susan. She will prepare a, a spreadsheet. The teachers arrive at eight o'clock. Um, if they're not on duty, they're going to their classrooms. If they're on duty, they're waiting at the door. Um, we'll have the list that Susan's compiled and know which students have been screened and which students have not been screened. I'm setting up schedules for a staggered arrival around the bus and the older kids in um, the Heisler Marshall cohort will enter through the blacktop door and the younger children in the Robert Groves cohorts will enter through the front door. Two different adults will be checking them in. If they don't have a mask, we'll be giving them a mask, having them hand wash preferably or sanitizer if it's getting, um, you know, a lot of kids coming at once. But hopefully with the staggered time, we figured that would take about a half hour to get everybody checked in and staggered into the building. So during that time, most teachers always assigned morning work um, where the students will go to their desks, put away their things and proceed with their morning work. Next slide. At 8.45, the, all the classes have some kind of a morning meeting and greeting where they do their breathing, they do their check-ins for social emotional learning, review the schedule. Um, rather than sitting on the rug in a tight little group, they'll be seated at desks, but we, we will still do the morning meeting, followed by about an hour of an academic block, which for some groups might also be their unified arts break. Around 10, between 10 and 10.40, the recesses will happen. Again, they'll be staggered or in different locations so that the kids are not playing together school-wide as they have in the past, but they'll remain with their cohort um, playing either on the blacktop or, or on the field. I come back uh, to the pavilion or to the classroom, dep whether depending, have another academic block or unified arts class, and then have the staggered lunch recess or some kind of instructional block depending on how the schedule works out once we actually put it into practice with Lisa and the arrival of lunch, etc. We plan on eating outside as much as possible. Um, after lunch, there's one more hour of academic block and we're proposing to end our day at two o'clock um, because as you saw with the cohorts, our teachers have no planning time and no time to collaborate. Um, so at two o'clock, we'll have the stagger get on the bus schedule. The teachers will have that hour to plan and collaborate together. And at three o'clock, our after school program, which will start off as virtual and our world language program will be offered starting at three as an after school program. And then as I mentioned, mask breaks will be determined and expected from time to time. Next slide. If you're a remote student, um, you are going to be meeting with your remote classroom team in the morning, um, going through a similar kind of process of greeting everyone, 
dealing with social emotional um, wellness activities etc a share and then individual students might have individual schedules as they move into their academic block so sometime between 9 15 and noon a variety of different things will happen um, if the child is say for instance a third fourth grader they will attend the third fourth grade unified arts classes remotely so our um, unified arts staff will be presenting mostly remotely and i'll talk it's it's a little bit complicated but i'll i'll talk about how that might look but that's the place where our students who are remote can interface with their um, classmates at school then when they're not attending any special events or, or unified arts with their classroom they'll be doing working and completing it independently much like they did in the spring with the direction of the um, remote facilitator we'll call her rather than a teacher she's not going to be necessarily teaching lessons to everyone but more or less facilitating their learning at each of their individual grade levels that remote teacher will plan and collaborate between two and three with all of the other teachers so although they'll be collaborating together work will be submitted independently to the remote teacher um, and that person will be responsible for the grading and evaluation and collection of that student's work we are going to hold thursday morning meetings once we get rolling and um, as we did in the spring field day and some events that we were able to envision or re reimagine as remote activities for students those will all be available for students who are at home as, as will the after school program. Next slide. So we expect the unified arts are part of an adequate education according to New Hampshire regulations and there are certain standards that must be mastered for them as well. So in this respect, we anticipate that most of the unified arts folks will deliver all or some of their content remotely. Mrs. Weeder for music, Mrs. Arndt for library media will teach remotely for all students um, and everyone's expected to attend. Mrs. Porter and Mrs. Scribner and Tin Mountain will do a com combination of face-to-face if they are able to be outside or inside weather permitting um, mainly using kind of a workshop model i know some of you on the board might be familiar with that where the teacher presents a mini lesson the goals and then sets the kiddos off to do their activities so if you're home you'll attend the mini lesson part and have a little bit of time to correspond with your classmates and then everybody will be sent off to practice the face-to-face -face kids will practice with that teacher at school and the at-home kiddos will do the work on their own and then submit something afterwards um, when we all need to move inside all of the uni unified arts will be remote okay so special services to kiddos, um, we have made an arrangement for uh, both face-to-face -face and or remote according to the specific needs of the student. Our outside contractors will be mostly providing services remotely or in a one-to-one -one situation that they discuss with families and set it up in a separate space using masks and a plexiglass shield separate from the classroom. Um, we are fortunate that we have three certified special educators on staff so we are able to prevent that one special ed identified teacher from having to go in and out of all of the classrooms so we're, we're setting up a schedule whereby some of the older students might get more of the remote even though they're a face-to-face -face student they might get some of their special services remotely in the classroom in order to maintain the cohorts and provide all of the services students may need without um, violating the, the cohort model. So lunch and stacks, as I mentioned, will be staggered and scheduled. Um, we will be able to provide free and reduced lunches to the eligible families, but not to everyone as we have been since spring. 
Other students who wish to purchase lunches may still be able to do so. So on the bus, um, I know that we did a survey and we asked folks about whether you could provide transportation or not. The bus routes are gonna be a little bit different, particularly in the afternoon, but there will be a routine where masks are required for all students riding the bus. They're going to be asked to use hand sanitizer as they get onto the bus and sit in an assigned seat and remain there masked for the entirety of their trip. Um, the older, we're gonna use the different entrances for those students as well as students who arrive with their parents. Um, it, I, think, I think it's in another slide, but in the afternoon, in order to facilitate the early drop off of two o'clock, we've had to shift the bus routes in the afternoon. So the high school will dismiss at 1.30, I believe. I might be mistaken on that, but the high school will be dismissing early. So one driver will go to the high school and take all of those students home and then proceed to Bartlett to get the Bartlett students. Whereas the other driver will drive only the Jackson students. So it is possible that some of the community will see two buses in the same neighborhood at similar times. So that is all in order to enable us to get out at two while the high school gets out a little earlier and Bartlett will continue to get out at three. So in order to get the bus routes to work, we, we had to um, make some changes to that. So that does also mean some students are on the bus for a long time. So the bus driver is also going to clean between routes. Um, and so, for instance, the high school driver is going to need to take drop off the high school students and then clean and sanitize his bus before he gets to Bartlett to pick up the Bartlett students. But all the other rules apply, the mask, the hand sanitizer, and the assigned seats. And we just ask that parents um, supervise the younger kids in particularly getting on and off the bus to maintain that social distance piece. Um, I think I've really talked a lot about that. The staggered pickup, uh, faculty will use a rear door. Um, Miss Susan has been in practice now of hanging out her window and talking to people on the front sidewalk. So if parents feel the need to uh, communicate with Susan or drop her off some papers, they are asked to, to do that, to park off over by the Whitney Center and walk over and address Susan through her window. Um, I think that's all. Oh, the, well, the backpacks and kids, we won't have the coat rooms in the back. Um, it's too close together and congested. So we'll be changing routines around the classroom and hanging up their materials and supplies. Um, so the younger students will still use the cubbies, but we're hoping we'll have few enough so they'll be distanced apart from each other when they're hanging up their things. Next slide. So going home, I think that's a little redundant. The only new piece of information there is that we will not be um, having students stay after school and play on the playground or the blacktop after they're picked up with by parents. We're asking that at least until further notice that everybody take their student and head for home. Our after school enrichment program, we just elected Cassie Gilmore to that. She's got some great ideas about some virtual um, activities. I know uh, Kathy Bowie did, did a few last year. So we're hoping to offer some really cool after school enrichment uh, opportunities on Mondays and Wednesdays. And the World Language Program um, will move to after school as well and be optional. Um, for now, I haven't even begun to think about soccer, and so we're on hold at the moment for that. Starting the week of August 31st, the entire SAU and Jackson included will offer some orientation and step up days for kiddos where we'll be inviting each cohort to come to school to kind of wave at each other and practice their six foot distancing and take a look at the classroom and um, take a look at the pavilion and just, just kind of reconnect a little bit before the actual first day of school. 
Um, this is going to give families and their kiddos a chance to see their classrooms, see the staff, and, and um, begin the transition process. We, we know that it's been a long time since those kiddos have been in our building and that we're going to need to work extra hard to reestablish a comfort level with coming back to school, especially with everybody with masks on their face. And so we want to recognize that um, we'll be spending a lot of time trying to build team teams when we first get back and establish new routines. And um, we also were thinking about the take a break stations that we already have in place that we're setting up at least one, if not two, that can be take a break from your mask stations as well for youngsters to use, being cognizant of, of the struggle that it is for adults, gonna be even harder for kiddos. So we will put a schedule together and invite families once we know for sure um, what the cohorts will be. Next slide. So in order to pull off the cohort um, of, of between nine and 12 students in a particular cohort, I'm needing to shift the current configuration. Basically, it involves moving the fifth grade to the sixth grade, so having a five, six instead of a standalone six, and then shifting the third grade to a three, four configuration, um, two being our largest group, um, and, and K-1. And again, I put the little asterisk there because as you saw, there are four new students out there and, and seven or eight students who have not committed. Um, so when I get the final numbers of what people are going to commit to, I may need to shift that a bit or move classrooms around. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can all make a decision really quickly and then parents will be able to get back to me quickly so the staff can start to think about new curriculum, how to integrate new teams of kiddos together and um, move forward with our planning and, and getting school underway. Next slide. So the board asked me to let them know what I thought we would need to do this. Um, I will be assigning one teacher for the remote classroom, so I would need a long-term substitute for that teachers to replace that teacher or to be the remote teacher, depending on skill sets that I'm looking at. Um, my, I originally did not think I needed a paraprofessional in the K-1, but if, again, all those three um, new students arrive, that's going to be nine in the K-1 with one individual. So. Um, I will likely request a long-term sub as a para as well. Uh, you've changed Jenny's hours and added an hour to her day, which will, which will help us meet the needs of, of all of the kids. Um, and I'm also um, maybe looking at a class being large enough to need to use the art room rather than the small room in the back uh, playground area. So, um, I'd like to be able to use the Whitney Center on Fridays, which I'm happy to run by the Whitney Committee. Uh, they're not really using it at the moment anyway, but, but that would commit the Whitney Center to the school for an unknown amount of time until we ever get, if we ever get back to normal. Um, and then the custodial hours, I'm not necessarily asking for a set amount at the moment, just an understanding that should the Whitney Center get going again, it's going to increase the amount of sanitizing and cleaning that needs to be done for student use each day. So it could potentially um, add some custodial time for that cleaning and sanitizing piece. And then here's where you get to ask me the questions. You might turn on your mic. All right, so I have a few questions, if I may. <clears throat> Are we looking to replace John as a part-time custodian? Yes, I have already placed an ad for his position, yes. And his, his position, I have always hired that person as you are 20 hours plus available for extra events and so forth at the Whitney Center. And I believe it's been budgeted with some extra hours in the budget as well. Thank you. 
And then um, should we, um, just to make sure you have the numbers that you need in time to make the last minute changes to your classrooms and stuff, as well as complying with the 14 to 10 day quarantine time, should we ask people to commit no later than next Monday to what they're going to do? Because that would, that would be 14 days before September 8th. Right, I was, I was going to ask for Friday. Okay. Um, so that, because staff starts returning next week and I'd like to have my ducks in a row before they all arrive so we know what we're dealing with. Okay, and then the other thing I did want to make sure that people know in the community is that the staff at the school is being um, above and beyond in their personal life as well as to committing to make sure that they stay safe for their students and for themselves as well, but for the students is, some teachers have uh, sacrificed um, what I would call huge family moments to stay home and make sure that they don't have to quarantine, but they can be active in the school when they need to be now. So um, thank you, Gail. Thank you to the staff for just going above and beyond to make sure that our little community stays safe. So thank you. Thank um, you for recognizing that. Yeah, it's big. Um, all right, other questions? Kate, Jerry, Micah? Um, can I ask a question about masks? Um, can we kind of dial in that buffs, neckies, bandanas, due to recent research, is, are not suitable? They're not double fabric. Um, just I know that a lot of families are more comfortable in those things, uh, but just kind of putting that in the fine print. Um, and my other question about masks is um, the staff protocols. Um, is everyone in the building um, wearing masks at all times as a staff unit? Yes. Um, the, the only exception would be if you are in your classroom by yourself or I am in my office by myself, those will be our mask breaks, but anytime your door is open or you're interfacing with anyone, we're wearing masks. And the other question was answered already in the presentation that they do have to be double fabric uh, masks. So, and if they don't have a proper one, the school will supply one. Supply one, right. I have a question about the uh, when Helen went through the protocol and I actually see that Jess Dovella has a similar question. I just want to clarify what symptoms generate the need to have a COVID test or the presumed positive. Is it a fever? Is it, you know, when I, I did look at that link and it talks about a runny nose. So just wanted to get more clear for parents um, um, and everyone involved. So yeah, a runny nose is one of the symptoms. So what, what's been recommended from the um, CDC, I mean, from the DHS, from Dr. Chan, um, is that, ki so kids are gonna come to school and they're gonna have these symptoms that we all know the kids have. They can make an appointment with their PCP, get a test. If, if it's a child who has a history of allergies, and this is an allergy time of year, they come back with their negative test and documentation from their doctor that this is something we're going to be expected. You'll notice if you look in the um, in that uh, New Hampshire School Nurses Association and in the CDC and the DHHS um, uh, guidance, it says new or unexplained symptoms. So if you can't, if you're a person who, like me, every time the storm clouds roll in, I get a headache, I know that about myself. I don't go and get a test every time that headache happens. If I'm having an unexplained headache or an unexplained runny nose, new and unexplained, then I get tested. For the purposes of school, we want all that documented for those kids. So that's why the first time we're likely to send them for a test. The test will likely be negative and they'll come back with a documentation from their PCP that this is no longer an unexplained symptom. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Um, I do have a question about the testing. I don't know if I missed it or not. Um, who will be paying for the tests? So the insurance will cover them if people are insured. I, I honestly, and I, and people who are on um, whatever the healthy kids now, the, that stuff will be, will be covered. Um, the state is covering some of those tests, but to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure where the status is with that funding. Some of it came out of CARES Act stuff and there was supposed to be stuff in the new legislation that never happened. Um, so uh, insurance and then 
to be determined as far as what's going on with the state funding. Thank you. And if, if I could go back to Keith asked a question about students who need to be out. If the student is face to face and they need to quarantine for 10 days, their face to face cohort teacher will provide them with materials just as if they were ill um, normally. The um, remote students would stay under the tutelage of the remote teacher. So as soon as the 10 days were over, they come back face to face like they would if they had any, any kind of a pneumonia or what, what any other kind of disease. Great. So uh, Keith had another question, which I think was already answered in the presentation, as far as um, you're allowing the cohorts and the students to come to school in staggered, you want to review that again? Yep. I... Um, we are we are just holding an ori orientation day, um, and each of the teachers will, or the cohort leaders, teachers will walk through what their schedule will be and where the areas are. Um, it, that's an idea that I can present to them if they could try to make it what the day will look like um, if the schedules are done. So that wouldn't be a problem. And the reason that we're asking parents to test their children at home as opposed to waiting for them to get to school is to limit the exposure should there be an issue, correct? Yes. Okay. So someone asked a question as to why not do it at school. The whole point is to keep them home if they have a fever before they even get to school or on the bus um, and when possible. And Gail, did I hear correctly that you're going to be sending out an email every morning? And if I, as a parent, have not responded to that email by the time that I've done this screening for my child, that when I respond, then when you don't receive an email from me by the time school starts, that you'll be screening all of those children when they get to school. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. And Kevin, I don't know if Gail, if you know this, but I heard this in the SAU 9 presentation, someone answered that there is a place local that you can get a test in the afternoon and have the answer by the next morning. Is that correct? Yeah, the, um, uh, well, go ahead, Helen. Well, I was just gonna say that um, the this, this test, testing that the state is doing through the um, National Guard has a really long, like two weeks. But Rich Laracy and Wenda Saunders both said that both Saco River and the hospital have um, 24 to, to 72 hour turnaround times. So we sh so if they go to their primary, their PCP, as opposed to just the state, they're gonna get a quicker turnaround time. I had a question about orientation for the kids. Um, I heard that the staff would have an orientation. Um, are the students all gonna have orientation, basic teaching hand washing, pass proper how you take your mask on and off, how you don't touch the front of it, um, all of these um, little nuances are we, are we planning to do, I'm sure in the classrooms, but will there be, there be kid um, orientation as well? Yes, there will be, yep. There'll be both actually, we'll, we'll do orientation and then we'll do practice for several weeks because we don't expect them to be perfect right away. We know there's gonna be a learning curve. Um. So another thing, so if a student tests positive, the school board in the last meeting uh, voted to have anybody who's in our school, we leave it up to Kevin, that if anybody in our school or in the community tests positive, Kevin will react extremely quickly, quicker than having us all meet as a school board and gal to send out the notification that we will not be going to school because someone tested positive. So for Jackson, we've approved that if one person or child tests positive, the whole school will go remote immediately. I think that answers that question. And then Kathleen has a question in reference to, and I knew the seats will be marked where children sit. There are no more circle times. People will stay at their desks. They're seated uh, at their desk for circle time. We're having circle time. They're just seated right. at their desks or in chairs, six feet apart, socially distanced. Um, and yes, we are posting signs about hand washing and mask wearing, and there will be some um, 
John Stokey has a six foot stick and we've talked about ropes with knots in it to help them learn how to walk six feet apart. So we'll employ a number of hands-on visual aids um, to help them help figure it out. We might even ask them to, to plan and measure it and make it a math lesson. So Jessica, we'll get to the other schools um, after we're done with JGS. So thank you. Uh, can I, I ask a question from the public? Yes, please. Okay, so what is your uh, residency requirement? Um, because I'm a little concerned that we've got a few people and I heard this from someone today. Um, they're considering coming to Jackson from another state and staying in the grandparents' home here and registering their child in the Jackson Public Schools. Um, I'm just curious, when I lived in Connecticut and taught there, we were very strict on our residency requirement. Um, any comment on, on that is what so would happen? Our, Kevin, do you want to talk about the, what the requirements are? Sure. Sure, so, so there are a few different things. Um, obviously, you also have uh, the displaced students. So we go through that process as well. So they may qualify under the McKinney-Vento Homeless Act. So depending upon who these students are, we go through that process. They would go okay. through the registration piece of, they would have to prove they are a resident by bringing in uh, certain pieces of inc uh, information you know, the mail, their electric uh, utility bills, uh, you know, mm -hmm. lease agreements, those type of things. Um, but uh, no, they, they would go through that, that process. Um, and then, you know, they can enroll. If they're coming from outside of New England, obviously we would quarantine them before they were to, to come into the schools. Um, but there's, uh, yeah, they, you know, it's hard to say. We've seen some increases in some schools and some some decreases. Uh, but no, there is a registration piece that has to prove residency. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on JGS from the board or the community at large? Can I ask a social emotional question? Um, I'm just curious about what our plan, I know there's there's been a lot of talk about the social emotional needs of our kids and getting them back to school in order to really um, protect them in those ways and see where they're at and make sure to kind of build them up when they need it. Um, have we as a school talked at all about um, that if we, if we do this model well um, for our face-to-face -face learning um, and we put all of these things in place, um, that school as we know it for all of our children that have gone to JGS in the past, um, will not look anything like the school that they know and love. Um, that there will be a sense of grief for all of those kids, um, a sense of loss, um, that wearing a face mask limits everybody around you's ability to, to know how you're feeling um, and all the nonverbal communicating that educators do um, with their students all day. Um, and I wonder if you could just speak, speak to that a bit. Well, last year um, we piloted and began working. We established a social emotional learning committee and began to address the castle um, standards for social emotional learning and dabbled in it a little bit. Our goal this year before COVID was to fully implement a formal uh, social emotional learning plan. We had Alex, her last name escapes me at the moment, but um, someone came and assessed our environment and some of the things we had in place for supporting individual learners and um, mental health and all of those kinds of things that go into a secure environment for kiddos. And she made several recommendations that are a part of our plan already. Um, we worked with Brian Hastings from um, Conway L's former principal who is now a consultant for social emotional learning. So he is scheduled to come on the 27th 
and we're looking at the agenda for that day is to translate the principles and practices that we were working on to a COVID environment and what that means for our kiddos. So it's a bit of a work in progress, to be honest with you. But I think that um, our faculty has always, always, because we're so small, we're more like a family, um, been looking for ways to connect, like you know the field day that we did last year and my teachers running around with iPads trying to get kids really excited about learning and um, pulling kids out into the hallway and the, the uh, stations that we've set up around the building to help students either move so they can settle their, themselves and be ready to learn or whether they need to have some calming quiet time. So we're going to continue to build on our repertoire of skills for that um, with, you know, as I said, you, you hit the nail on the head that I've been grieving. My school doesn't look or feel like it used to, and it's hard for all of us. So, um, you know, that kind of modeling about, yeah, we know, we know it's different and it's hard. And so this is what we're trying to do um, to help us stay focused and ready to learn because that's our mission. Kevin? Yeah, and, and Kate, you bring up a, a great, great question, right? We, we've never been through this before. We want to know what it is. The good news is, is that you now have a full-time guidance counselor, family support liaison in your building. And, and I say that because you didn't last year at this time. And I think when that was developed, you were looking at how can we outreach some of these other pieces. But I think you know, the priorities on the talent Gale and, and you folks what to do, but the priorities for that position may change as a result of this whole COVID-19. So some of those other pieces that we thought were, were really important when we started may have to get reprioritized to, to address some of the things that, you, that you're talking about. But that's, that's the good news is you have a full-time person in that building now, or at least in the, in the district. There's a, Yetta has a question, uh, where will the curriculum for remote learners come from? Will it follow classroom learners? Yes, and that's part of the rationale behind providing the common planning time across all of the teachers at the same time. Um, and we're, we're focusing on what Kevin always calls the big rocks, the, the biggest, most important standards. Um, so the teachers will be corresponding frequently. We'll use some um, online materials based on the Common Core, which our standards, our district standards are based on those as well. So it will uh, connect pretty well together. I have a question about how to, for, to support teachers as well as students as circumstances change. I understand the need, and correct me if I'm wrong, but right now the, under, the plan is that parents commit um, through the end of December, right? Like if they're gonna opt for remote versus face-to-face. -face. Is there any flexibility around that because of Jackson being the size it is, or is it gonna stay on that cadence and have had um, inside of like how the teacher cohorts are built or is there any flexibility with them should circumstances change um, in their families or with um, their loved ones? Well, we, um, we are looking at the first trimester because that is how my teachers generally plan in three kind of segments for each of the trimesters. So we were asking for a commitment to the end of the first trimester because we know what needs to be achieved and can lay the groundwork and, and feel like we can teach. Now, anytime we get a new student, we are required to take them in. Um, but it just, it makes it a lot harder and it could, um, you know, put the class sizes in jeopardy, the cohorts in jeopardy, adding one or two students um, without, needing to re so I don't want to be rearranging all of my class sizes or my classrooms in October um, whereas if we had to do it once during the year we could manage that but it's basically logistics and to kind of protect my teachers from having to start over and integrate a new um, student of course. Thanks. Sorry, I have family in the background, so I'm muted. <laughs> I, I, I'm crying here too, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Yeah, I can, I can appreciate the complexity of all of it, and I think it's good to hear 
all that you're handling with all this and also understand that it's, it's, um, yeah, it's not a perfect system um, as much as you guys are trying to do as perfect a job as you can with it. No, and I'm really fortunate, like as Jen said, with my staff, I have not heard from any one of them, I don't think I can do this, I don't want to do this. You know, they're all like, how can we figure this out when they were tasked with, this is what the board's asking, this is what our families think, what can, what can we do? Um, they were more than happy to throw out all kinds of creative ways to make it work. So. Um, I want to give them a lot of credit, but I also want to protect them a little bit from, because they'll do whatever they need to do. They'll bend over backwards to make it happen. Um, but awesome. I don't want to stress them out either. So, Yeah, and I would say from a board standpoint that, I mean, obviously we're having a lot more communication <laughs> right now. And as much as you can keep us informed on all of the creativity when we have our meetings, I really want to give you the space to share with us what's coming up from teachers, how you're seeing it. I mean, obviously this is not a static environment. So, you know, our board meeting a month from now, we're going to have a lot of learning. And I, I want to make sure that we're giving time so that we're hearing that and we're having discussion and space around it as we evolve over the next couple months together. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. Thank you. Keith had another question in reference to classrooms being outdoors. I answered him, but I realized it was private. I think most of the uh, weather would have the main decision on how often we use the outside classrooms. And I know we said we were trying to use them as much as possible. So it also depends on who, who's already outside. So. Right. We're, we're going to be signing up for particular chunks of, of time so that everybody knows what the schedule is. Um, like the outdoor circle of benches out in the back logs there's nothing over the top of them then there's insects and there's other things out there that don't make that area as pleasant as the picnic tables at the pavilion the um tent is going to be more flexible in that the tables and chairs will be able to be moved the gazebo can be used across the street for small group meetings so it's it's going to be kind of a facility sign up and depending on the activity that the teachers want to do, um, they're good at sharing. So, so we'll figure out a way that um, we can also clean and sanitize even though the um, surfaces aren't as much of a transmitter as we once believed, we still want to make sure that things get sanitized between uses. Great, I think that should answer that. Any other questions on the plan at this point in time? No. So I would like to take a moment to address at this point, um, I know we're doing Jackson first, so if there's no other real questions on Jackson, um, there, Jessica brought up an excellent question for our, all our students, K through 12, um, that the VLAX seems to be waitlisted at this point in time and uh, the schedule we got that. Is there an option for VLAX? What's the plan for that, Kevin? Yeah, that. Um, so I, I, I'll try and answer the question as I understand it. So uh, if you are a middle or high school student, I guess it would depend on whether it's the distance learning option or whether it's the face-to-face -face option. So let's say for high school students, there are some courses that will only be offered face-to-face. -face. And I'm thinking about career tech courses in perhaps some of the other courses. Um, so at the middle school, if you choose the distance learning piece, uh, you know, you'll get most of the core academic pieces that would be offered to you and and then you'd have to try and supplement that in some way shape or fashion uh yeah VLAX is is waitlisted but that was at the k through six level i know seven through 12 th those numbers are changing a little bit so uh when i listened to steve kozlowski who's a director on friday he was saying that there were more high school uh courses being offered at, at this point that was friday um, but it's it's really it is a dynamic piece. But but um, if they cannot do not offer class, they need to take. So uh, I guess it would have to be specific to which course that it would be. 
Um, I noticed that one of the high school guidance counselors is on here. Those schedules are being developed. The high school is still chasing down folks to find out uh, which which courses are or which students are doing distance learning and which students are doing the uh, the face to face piece. So. Uh, I would reach out specifically to guidance counselors if you're distance learning and you're looking for a particular class because there are other options as well. Thank you, Kevin. I do believe we addressed oh, the answers that have come through here and just want to make sure everybody has a chance to ask questions while we're here in person per se. So if anybody else has a question, they want to type it or just ask. Go ahead, Kate. I wanted to ask, yeah, about, um, I know the New Hampshire um, Commissioner of Education rolled out the state invested a bunch of money into like a lot of funding um, into something called I Learn New Hampshire and the Canvas program. Um, I haven't read a ton about it, but I did read a bit about it. And I'm just curious if our SAU um, is participating. I'm muting. Uh, right now, we're, we're using the Google platform, Google, Google Classroom as is the majority of the, the platform for it. Um, we've looked into it right now, but one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that, that the teachers and the staff were comfortable. So there is a platform that we use that, that does follow our curriculum and to, to switch over at this point was not something that, um, that we were really invested in, in going through that amount of training to add just even a little bit more anxiety or stress to the staff members who were pretty fluent. So if we move back to uh, remote learning or distance learning, we feel as though that platform kind of goes back and forth. But uh, now I'm a, a little familiar with, with iLearn in, in Canvas, you haven't taught at the, the, the college level as well. I think that we have as good a program for consistency in our district that people are familiar with. Um. Thank you, Kevin. Miss uh, Miss Melissa has a question. Maybe she's on mute. Hi. Oh, there you well, go. It's, it's a comment. I didn't. I stepped out of the room, and I don't know whether I missed the citizens' comments section, the second citizens' we're, comments, or if we're I in a great how we've been in it for a little while. We're almost wrapping it up. Oh, okay. Um, so I just wanted to share that um, I was feeling tentative about school reopening and a little nervous, but I met with Gail last week and she shared the plan with me that she shared with you folks tonight. And I completely changed my tune about coming back to school. I felt excited. I felt um, like the, I think the plan is brilliant. And because of our numbers, I think we can totally do this plan and make it work and keep everybody safe. And um, it was just an interesting transition that I went through. And I just want to give kudos to the people that were involved in creating this plan. And um, I think we're super fortunate to be able to um, present this to the board. And um, I can't say enough about how happy I am about the plan and I hope it is voted on to move forward and um, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Willis. That's really sure. great to hear your trajectory and it's a big vote of confidence. So Gail, Jessica brings up a great uh, point here on the last, uh, one of the last questions. So if we could do a little bit more clarification for distance learning and remote learning for how it works for us at JGS. Okay, yes, great. Um, because, because it is a, a bit different. Um, we, when the SAU 9 plan came forward, there was the uh, distance learning, the hybrid, face-to-face, -face, and then remote. So um, for us, the remote still looks the same. That's when the entire school 
goes online via Google Classroom and everybody is remote due to increased transmission in the community. We eliminated a hybrid model just because our numbers were small enough to enable us to um, not have to do that to keep our numbers small enough because the hybrid model was intended to only have half of the students in and half of the students out on a rotating basis. So we eliminated that from our conversation. What we have changed is that there really isn't going to be what the SAU refers to as distance learning that all of our students who are not opting to be face-to-face -face will be uh, partially integrated throughout the week through special events, activities, and unified arts. Um, but they're doing remote learning with a teacher from our school, from our community, which was, I think, a big concern with the distance learning. Um, you might not have your Jackson teacher, you might have a teacher from Bartlett or for Conway, you'd be with a cohort of students from around the SAU, whereas our plan is Jackson staff members with Jackson students um, with an option to be remote and still be somewhat included in our classroom um, activities. Which is outstanding, I think. So before we vote on this, if we need to vote on this, um, I just wanted to wrap up that we have a few um, <clears throat> few contingencies per se with this plan, not contingencies, but action items. So if we vote on this, they will have a um, cohort scheduled meeting to walk through the school and that will be coming out from you with the schedule of when kids and parents can come to the school, correct? Right. Um, first, they will get a uh, kind of a contract agreement to say, yes, I am definitely going remote or yes, I am definitely going to be face to face, which in will enable me to shift the cohorts if I have to and assign rooms differently. Um, and then I'll need to give the teachers a little bit of time to prepare their rooms and get them ready. So, um, and schedule with them all of the different meetings that we'll have. So, after I know, say by this Friday, if I know what everybody is doing for sure, then we'll begin to schedule the cohort meetings for the week after that. All right. And then we're also asking parents who are on the fence about sending their children to or from school remote or in person to answer by Friday. Right. And to commit to one or the other. Okay, great. In addition to that, if there are any new students that register, we will be asking them to quarantine for 14 days, regardless of when they may be coming into school. So if they don't make it by Monday here in the community, then, they, then the time clock starts from whenever they come to the community for 14 days. That's a policy you're asking to put into play. Yes, I don't think the CDC would say if they were from New Hampshire, Maine, or Vermont that they wouldn't have to. Is that true? I'm I'm talking kind of off the top of my head, but um, but I'm happy to in, enforce that policy if the board agrees that that's what they want to do. We'll we'll take a separate motion on that then. But I don't know what New Hampshire. Kevin, do you know that one? Yeah. So the 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 policy that the CDC has put out is if you're from outside of New England, you have to quarantine for 14 days. Is that the seven states of New England or is that just our new little New England? <laughs> our little New England. Yes. Yes. All right. Just clarifying. All right. The way Maine's playing right now, I think we should exclude them. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, with that being said, and um, Kathleen, that's an excellent recommendation to your comment about the guidance counselor, and that is something we'll put on the table with Gail to see what we can do about how she wants to fit that into the classroom. So I just want to make sure you knew that I understood and heard your question and suggestion. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on the reentry plan? All right, with that being said, I would like to take uh, a vote, a motion to adapt. So, Jen, yeah. kind of a process comment here. Go ahead, I, yep. I really appreciate the, the presentation and the question that we had and that everybody got to participate that, including you know parents and community members. 
I think that was really important for information to myself. Um, but um, I do have some comments that are kind of outside that as a board member that would be kind of board member discussion. Um, so I would like the opportunity, like when we make the motion to accept the, um, the re-entry plan to, to have some discussion as a board outside of input from the community. Um, Cause we, we, really haven't, we really haven't had an opportunity as a board to discuss it. And this is a really hard format when, when we're doing this remotely. Um, right. But I don't know whether anybody else has anything else to say as a board member, um, but just as a, it would be nice to have a little bit of a discussion between the board anyway. All right, well, why don't we take a, we'll take a motion and then we'll have a discussion. And, and I do that. The other thing I wanted to ask um, yep. as well, outside of the reentry plan, do we need to adopt the school calendar um, this evening um, or should we adopt the school calendar this evening? Kevin? Uh, typically, the SAU board adopts the calendar and then it goes kind of to, yes, it would be great if Jackson board would also uh except the the calendar as well yeah well cool. um i guess having said all that I, i'll make a motion to accept the re-entry plan as presented i'll right. second that great all right um so school board discussion jerry um, I, I just wanted to say kind of to echo what um melissa grady had said about um i think we're really fortunate to, to live where we do um you have to have the size school that we do and to have the, the facility that we do and have the resources that we do. It, it, it's, we're fortunate in that regard, but even more so to have the kind of staff that we do and administrators that we do. And, Ke and Kevin, you're included in this. I, I, I really think that we're very fortunate. This plan is, it's a really good plan. And as a board member, I get frustrated and this isn't a, a criticism. Um, haven't really participated in, in this process very much. Um, and I don't think we really could have. It's just a situation where it wasn't really warranted. I really would have preferred that you worked as hard as you did coming up with this plan than engaging with the board per se. Um, this was a really good presentation. It's a really good plan. Um, and I, I support it whole, wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Any other board comments? I could echo Jerry. Um, I think that everybody um, that I've been speaking with over time and people that have reached out um, to ask questions, I think tonight was the was the real thing that people were waiting for um, and the answers that people really needed to have and um, those charts scale were excellent and to really see the numbers at play um, to the best that we can at this moment. Um, and the thing that I heard resoundingly and consistently um, is the faith that our school community has in our staff, in our educators, in our support team, um, in the really high regard that um, we all hold all of you. Um, I think that's really resonates in the community. Um, and if there's a group of people that can pull off really high quality um, guidelines with public health at heart, um, I think that you have a lot of faith and trust um, from a lot of people in the community. Um, and I just wanted to commend that. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I'll echo what Kate said. That was very well said, so thank you. And I'm glad we did, Kate, we did this remote. I was looking forward to seeing people in person, but I do feel based on the level of people who could attend, I don't think we would have all fit in the Whitney Center. So I think this was exactly what we needed to do. Um, and we all can see the presentation and everything went fine that way, logistically. So I'm very happy about that as well. Yeah, and I wanna add not only thanking Gail and the Jackson Reentry Committee as well as Kevin and the larger one, but all of the parents who've hung in there. Um, I know that it's there have been a lot of questions and I think as Kate said, like this is what everybody was waiting for and it's been a journey to get here um, inside of a kind of how the world has in the US and New Hampshire. So thanks for everybody's patience and the belief that we could do this together and I'll echo what everybody else said that I'm really impressed. I'm really proud of being part of, to be part of this community and to have great leadership like we're seeing right now to innovate and come up with a really good way to do this for our school, our teachers and our students. I think any other comments? Just wanted to kind of jump on what Micah said there about, the, you know, it, it is great that we have such parents if, that are willing to engage like that. Um, but it also shows, I think, that we do have administrators, Gail and, um, and Kevin, 
every time you've been asked the hard questions, you guys have responded confidently and, and quickly. You're not shying away from the hard questions. And, and that, that does give us a lot of confidence that, um, that you guys do have your safety and well-being really at heart. Thank you for that. Well, thank, thank you all. Your vote of confidence is, is well received and um, really appreciated. Great. All right. I think we have a good round here. Everybody said their piece. I think we should make them take a vote. All those in favor of adapting the new proposed Jackson Ranchi to school program. Say yes. Janet yes. Lowley. Jerry Doherty. Yes. Kate Fournier. Yes. Micah Burhart. Yes. Good luck, Al. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I will make a motion, Ashley, to accept the uh, SAU 9 school calendar. Second. All those in roll call for that? Yep. Jen? Jen? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Yes. Kate? Yes. And Micah? Yes. And to piggyback off of the, um, do we want as a school board to um, vote in a 14 day uh, quarantine before students enter the school? If they're coming from out of state or out of town, I don't, I don't know what you want to do. I'm just putting it out there. I, I don't see any harm in, in doing so. I mean, I'll, I'll make the motion to, to do so. I need a minor clarification about what we mean by little New England and big New England. <laughs> right. So I'm thinking anybody. I'm not from New England initially. So <laughs> I'm thinking anybody outside of SAU 9 or 13, just to be really clear, just to be clear. Okay. You know, if you want, I mean, this will, we have some people that are very, you know, conscientious and nervous. And if we throw one student in two days prior, one day prior, that's moved from Manchester or yeah. another area that we perceive as a hot spot. Are we going to feel comfortable with that after all this work that we've done? So, yeah, I can see a lot of value in that. Okay. So, I mean, it would just be a few days that they would have to wait and they could start remote. I don't know if it would be the end of the world. Somebody. Kevin, is there a precedent for that? Like, um, yeah, there's state law that, that says you need to educate children, and you may run into a little bit of a, an issue. I, I think that um, reasonable people would be reasonable. Uh, the state okay. can step in. If, so, for example, Rhode Island, right? We're all watching these numbers all the time, and Rhode Island's numbers are way more significant. We're down less than, you know, 0.6 per 100,000. And the rolling seven-day numbers, right? That, that's Carroll County right now. Um, so the screening process, and, and it may be, I don't know, about 10 or 14 days, but um, you, yeah, you got to be careful about how you were there. If you're educating the kids, you can put in whatever you'd like, right? So, so if you say, hey, look, you're going to be remote for the first 10 days, and we're going to re-enter you into the, you know, the morning meetings, and we're going to assign you to meet. But you have to educate the students, so that that's the one piece. So if yeah, you want to say you're going to have a, yeah. a ten-day waiting period to come face to face, you could probably do that. Okay, so you don't see us makes it a bit less sticky um, yeah. from a legal and protocol standpoint. I would just I think that'd be going remote. So yes, when this school started, but yes, to make that clear. Thank you, Kevin. Anybody else want to weigh in? I'm, I'm okay with waving it, but I just, we've done so I much. I think it's a great idea. I think that we've done a lot where it's a small school and a small program that we have. And um, there have been a lot of people moving around just like that. I mean, we're all aware of that reality. So if we can do that and we can language it right and Kevin doesn't think we're going to run into another legal issue, I would be in support of that. Are we asking, so I, I, I might've missed it, but I've been, I've been hearing a bit 
um, about the teacher's expectation if they go out of state um, and that kind of thing. Um, are we requiring that no family is traveling like interstate at this point? Well, also, it, was like, kind of just, it kind of, if you have a parent that travels for their job, we're not telling that family that they have to be remote, correct? Um, that's that's not part of the guidance. The no. guidance, they're, they're, the um, DHHS people have said that um, a, a family member traveling is not a reason to quarantine a child or to isolate a child. That's the, the state guidance. I think you can always go tighter if you want to, uh, but the guidance does not specify for that. Did that change in the past couple of weeks? Because I asked that question specifically during the SAU meeting and got a different answer. So that was the, the if I could jump in, that was the, the local doctors on the committee who at that okay. time, absolutely. I have a meeting with them tomorrow and I'm going to see. See, we're chasing so many different pieces, of right? Course. So, So that is, but that was the answer that they had given, Micah, was outside of New England, you have to quarantine for a period of time. That's still into effect. Now, we've also seen documentation that says, if you do not use public transportation, if you use your own vehicle, right? That wasn't part of the committee's recommendation, but now we're revisiting some of those pieces that, that it may change and it may change again. But right now that was the, the case. Uh, was if you are outside of New England, regardless of how you got there, um, you were going to quarantine for, for the period of time, the 10 days. But I just want to clarify, because Helen just said that's actually not the case, that a so, parent would not trigger that. So Kevin, on, on, in the, call, the DHHS call on Friday, this question right. was asked of Dr. Talbot. Were you on that call? And she specifically said, someone asked that question, if a parent travels, does a child need to be quarantined? And she said no to that specific question. Um, we can ask it again. We can ask Rich and Wenda again. Um, but that question was asked, and, and that was the answer on Friday from Dr. Chan and Talbot. Yeah, in, in, like I said, those, so those are at that level. And then the local level, that was the conversation with right. the two doctors. And that's why I have my standing 7.15 tomorrow morning meeting with those folks so I can ask those questions. So I don't want to say something that's not in the plan. We can amend the plan, just like uh, Helen had said, the nursing documents and the response protocol, that will go into the plan that gets updated right now. So we have been treating it as, it, as uh, the New England states, you have to quarantine for a period of time. So um, we'll, we'll revisit that tomorrow. So no one seconded my motion. I'm going to actually, I'm going to re retract my motion. I, I think it just kind of demonstrates how this kind of opens up a can of worms here. And if we go back to the um, reentry plan that was recommended to the SAU 9 board, which I ironically voted against, um, it, it, I think it spelled out that, that stuff pretty well. Um, and I would rely on that. And, and what it also said is that these things are, are dynamic and changing constantly. Um, so to me, it makes more sense to, to kind of give Kevin the flexibility to do what needs to be done either on short, quick calls or on, you know, on thinking things through more reasonably as things change. So I'm, I'm happy to keep it the way it is and as, as the reentry plan that we voted on tonight, I'm still in favor of that and, and not, not amending it at this point. Okay, I'm fine with that as long as we are in agreement on that and we're aware and that if parents are coming in from outside of the New England area, we are asking them to abide by the SAU-9 requirements. Okay. Good? All right. Good. We don't have to vote on that. Do we, Jerry? Okay. So we voted on the re-entry. We're able to move on. Board member issues? Any committee reports? I don't know how you'd have time for them. None? Good. Board discussion, consider re-entry plan and return scenarios. We've done that. Set date for next meeting, September 21st. Go ahead. Oh, somebody barking. Set date for next meeting, September 21st at 6 p.m. Uh, 
Any other citizen comments at this time? Kevin, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, there will be an SAU 9 meeting on August 27th. Just mark your calendar. And that will just be to basically update all the conditions and in, in where, where we're at. So people can attend or not attend. But. And that's also our final view at the numbers in the community, right? Yeah. Okay. And again, um, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Kevin, and everybody in the, in the school board itself for all your time and dedication to making sure that we're talking to the community members and setting them in the right direction and making sure people fill out surveys and working with each other and patience with everybody on this um, outstanding. It's just a thrill to be part of this community and part of SA9. So thank you very much for allowing me to do that. Um, any other citizen comments at this time? No. And Kate and Micah have signed the manifest again. So thank you both. Appreciate that. You guys are a whiz at that scam thing. Um, all right. Hey, Jen, can you just reiterate the date and time for the SAU 9 meeting, please? I missed that. Sorry. August 27th, 6 p.m. And I'm sure there'll be a link if you want to go remote, or it'll probably be back at Floyd Auditorium again. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it's up to Kevin. Just go watch for that information. All right. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate all of you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everyone.